All right. Hello. It's good to be back. I haven't been here for a year. I don't think I've done a talk here in a couple, so it's nice to be here. We have more head down on JRuby uh, compatibility, getting Rails versions to run, trying to keep up with the rest of the Ruby community. Uh, so I wanted to give a little update on where we stand with uh, optimizing JRuby, a side of the, the project we don't get a lot of time on, but we do it pragmatically. Uh, and then talk a little bit about what it's looking like on Grawl, what we think we might be looking at in the future, and, and how we'll go forward. Uh, so let's get into this here. My basic information. Um, hard to believe 12 years working full-time on JRuby, but that's where we're at now. Uh, my job on the JRuby project is uh, maybe even like a 50-50 split between doing actual development work and managing community resources, making sure that contributors are working on the pieces they should be working on, uh, helping introduce people to our code base, all that kind of stuff, uh, and outreach to the Ruby community, making sure that if there's popular C extensions that we've got JRuby versions for them, uh, making sure that Rails and other libraries are not making decisions that are, are, are antithetical to performance or the way that Ruby should be done. Um, and I work uh, at Red Hat now for about five years in what we have, we call it a research and prototyping group, but we just kind of experiment with stuff. Uh, and uh, there's two of us there working on JRuby. Okay, so what's in this talk? There was a lot of, uh, a, a lot of folks online seem to get the wrong impression from this title. I learned that if you say how to do X without Y, the people who work on Y really get annoyed by that, that particular title. So I think maybe the title of this should have been uh, uh, Grawl as a JVM or Grawl from a JVM perspective, which is really what I'll be covering today. So let's talk about that. What we're going to go basic overview of JRuby. Saw a lot of new hands. There's a lot of uh, 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 regulars here that probably could use a refresher on some of the challenges of JRuby, the deci decisions we've made. Uh, so we'll do that. Uh, we will talk a little bit about the challenges of using Truffle in Ruby, why the Truffle Ruby JRuby combined project didn't really go forward, why we've not started looking at Truffle ourselves. Uh, and then I'll go over basically where we stand on optimizations we've done in JRuby. Uh, pragmatic, targeted little things that we've done over time to try and uh, at least beat the C implementation of Ruby, but provide better performance, the performance we'd expect on a JVM language. Uh, and a little bit of discussion about what we haven't done, which is perhaps the more important half of that. Uh, I'll throw some benchmarks up here. They are a range from a small numeric benchmarks up to uh, at least a large portion of the Rails stack doing a full database uh, set of queries, and we'll see what numbers look like across some of these implementations. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about what, what we hope to do in the future with JRuby, given all of the various options that we have now. What's not in this talk? Well, this is not a truffle bashing talk. I think a lot of people expected I was going to come up here and talk about why we shouldn't use truffle. Uh, what I'm talking about is why we aren't using it. That's all. Uh, practical details, what we need to do for our users, how we support them. Uh, so I believe most of the challenges to using Truffle are practical issues. Getting it out to the users in a, a supportable way, uh, avoiding getting locked into a particular JVM, a particular vendor. These are not technical issues. Truffle has definitely proved itself out technically that it can do some amazing things. We want to be able to do those things in a way that, that fits our users and does the best thing for the JVM community. Um, this is also not going to be any real assessment of Truffle Ruby and the approaches that they've taken. Uh, it's still very much in development. Uh, they will very honestly say that they are not ready for production, but they're looking good on certain performance benchmarks. They're looking not so good on others. There's work yet to be done. So I'm not doing any particular technical assessment of Truffle, uh, but I will show a little bit about where we stand, just a comparative amount of, uh, of, of benchmarking. Okay, so the JRuby review. Uh, this is a point I want to emphasize. So we have never focused purely on being just a Ruby implementation. If we were going to do that, there's all sorts of things we could do by going outside of the JVM spec uh, to make, make JRuby be a really solid, really good Ruby-only implementation. We have always been a JVM language. Uh, we want Ruby to run really well, but we also want it to be embedded into Java applications, be able to call out to Java libraries and integrate two ways with uh, good performance. Uh, to be able to deploy as part of a Java web application or a Java enterprise application. These are all very important parts of JRuby, and at least half the people that come to JRuby come to us because of our integration with Java and with the rest of the JVM, not solely because we are in many ways a better Ruby implementation. Uh, so that's a key point to keep in mind going forward here. 
Uh, the core of JRuby is largely written in Java. I've got some, some basic line of code counts later. Uh, but we've focused mainly on having uh, a, a typical JVM implementation. If there is a Ruby array object that's floating around in the system, it will be of type Ruby array, and you can go to Ruby array in JRuby and read through all the code. Uh, we're not doing a lot of magic generation behind the scenes. We're not doing something similar to Truffle where we have a, uh, an amorphous dynamic object that becomes all objects. If you look into JRuby with a Java profiler or with Java tooling, you will see actual Java classes. Uh, even to the point where if you implement Java interfaces from Ruby code, you get a Ruby object that actually implements a Java interface and it looks like a normal Java object throughout the system. These are key features for us uh, doing our integration. Uh, we do have parts of our core that are written in Ruby. Uh, and we share the bulk of the Ruby standard library with all the other implementations. So there is a large portion of Ruby that's part of the JRuby implementation. We're moving more and more there over time. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that later on. Uh, we support distribution and deployment pretty much like the CRuby folks do, where you're doing it all on the command line and you just start up a server and there it goes. Or, like I mentioned, deploying as a jar file or a war file, the typical Java deployment mechanisms. And they all work great. Uh, half the users that we hear from out there are basically sneaking JRuby into Java enterprise production settings. Uh, nobody really cares, nobody really knows. It just looks like another part of a, a Java application. Um, so that's a big way that we've been getting Ruby users without uh, the Java folks knowing even. Uh, another key point, uh, this is another diff a big difference with uh, Truffle Ruby. We worked for a while on supporting the C extension API of C Ruby. Uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of reasons why we decided to abandon it. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more in detail about that later. So we don't support the C Ruby extensions, but we have built up a very good ecosystem uh, within the Ruby community of JRuby extensions, and most of these libraries, when they come out, they're interested in supporting JRuby too. So it's, it's been less of a problem over time. So what are the challenges uh, to implementing JRuby? These are Ruby things and then just trying to build on the JVM things. So of course everything is dynamic in Ruby, more dynamic than, than a lot of languages. Uh, obviously method calls, we, we expect that method calls are gonna be dynamic. Uh, object shapes, object fields uh, are allocated dynamically at runtime. Uh, what you would you typically get in, for example, C Ruby, uh, which does not have a lot of these optimizations, you would get an object that basically has no space for fields, and then as code executes and you assign named fields, it needs to expand an internal store. So there's an array of values, it gets expanded on demand. Uh, Obviously there's issues with this. There's a lot more interaction. We have the extra overhead of the array there. We're not using very good use of the, uh, a very efficient use of memory and uh, locality of those values and a whole bunch of other reasons why we wanted to work around this. So this is, this is a challenge. Uh, constants, uh, I, I, this always sounds weird. Constants are dynamic in Ruby. Uh, so they are assigned at runtime once the code runs through, but when you go to look it up, you're not necessarily sure what the path is up your hierarchy or up your local scopes to find that constant. So constants need to be looked up dynamically at runtime, but they do stay largely constant after this. Uh, as with everything else in Ruby, there is an exception. You can go in and actually alter a constant, sort of like going in with reflection and changing a static final somewhere. Uh, it's typically not done, and unlike on the JVM, you will actually get warned that you're not supposed to do this, uh, recommend that you don't be modifying constants. So no one does this, but we still need to be able to support it in, in case that happens in a, a particular application. So dynamic everything, everything needs to be wired uh, at runtime. Uh, boxing is probably the next biggest thing that we run into with, with Ruby. Uh, so currently the call protocols that we have in JRuby are all object arguments, uh, and that permeates everything. Our data, data structures, our collection classes, they all only hold object, and so then of course if we're doing any numeric, numeric algorithms that need to store those values, uh, we're creating full, large, very large objects for longs and floats and so on. Um, value types will probably be able to help us with this in the future. Uh, we are looking at other optimizations above the JVM level and I'll show later we're, we're seeing some help with Grawl as well here. Uh, the promotion aspect of this is also a pain. Uh, so a 64-bit long, a fixed num in Ruby, if it happens to roll over that 64-bit range, it needs to automatically convert into a big num. Uh, so even if we were to specialize on 64-bit longs, we'd need a way to fall back to an object reference at some point. This is cumbersome things to do on the JVM. 
Uh, and we've only done very preliminary sort of work on this. Uh, the challenges of being able to have our numeric path de-optimized back into a, an object path hasn't been something that's on our plate, given all the other issues we work with. Uh, this case, again, almost never comes up in code. So like we could probably specialize on 64-bit longs and no one would ever notice that we're not overflowing unless they ran a test or tried to see that we actually were overflowing. Pretty much stay within a 64-bit long range. If you're going to use an arbitrary precision integer, you start with it. So that's, that's not really uh, a typical case, but we have to be able to support it. Uh, and then again, like I mentioned, all of our data structures still only support object references, uh, but this is something that we're going to be working on so we can pack things more tightly and, and get real primitives into there. Uh, a little bit of statistics here. So one of the benchmarks I'll run later is just a Mandelbrot generator. Uh, so if we generate a 200 by 200 image of a Mandelbrot, it constructs about 8 million float objects, uh, totaling about 317 megabytes of garbage. And this runs like that, but it's still creating a crap load of garbage. It's not GC that is pro our problem, it's this allocation rate. Creating all these objects that we almost immediately throw away actually ends up being the problem. And then of course you compound that with trying to stuff them into collections and the memory bloat from all the, the boxing. Uh, we know we're, we need to fix this, uh, but we've been doing pretty good so far without uh, heavy work on it. Uh, transient data structures, what do I mean here? Well, there's lots of features in, Ruby, in the Ruby language that look very simple, very lightweight, but behind the scenes, they end up creating a very large data structure uh, to transmit data from one call to the next. Uh, usually, this is in the dispatch side of things. Uh, for example, if you are passing var args, we're even worse than the case of passing var args in Java where you get a fixed size array and at least there's only one hop. In Ruby, it's a full Ruby array object with all of its mutability characteristics, all of the different features that are on it. Um, so you've got at least two hops to get at that data. We're constructing a lot more to pass those arrays, arrays through. Uh, this is something that we're working on trying to get rid of now. Uh, keyword arguments added a few versions back in Ruby. So when you pass keyword arguments, typically the way that it's done is it constructs a full hash map. That gets passed along the dispatch path. Those values are pulled back out into local variables. Uh, you never really need to see the hash, but the simplest implementation, the one that we have currently, is to just do that. And so we've found various ways of packing hash down. Uh, we're also looking at using invoke dynamic to bind those more directly through. But right now, this is, uh, this is overhead for us. And then you do run into little weird code patterns that Rubyists come up with. Uh, like this is one of the more unusual ways to do the implementation of min of two different values. Throw them into an array, sort them, and grab the smallest one. Uh, now the Truffle Ruby folks will say, oh, this is great. We, we are doing an excellent job of specializing through this code and optimizing it so that it actually does turn into just a comparison and a return. I would argue, if I found somebody writing this code in my organization, I would probably school them a little bit on not doing it this way and finding a better way to write it. We can optimize these things, but we have not spent a lot of time focusing on doing so because you shouldn't write code like this in the first place. So, uh, a little bit more depth on the, the, the richness of Ruby's argument structure. Here is a method definition that uses all the different forms of argument passing that you can use in Ruby. We've got normal positional arguments, uh, the B and the C with the parentheses around them there. If an array is passed at that position, it will destructure the array. Uh, B will get the first element, C will grab all the additional elements. Uh, we have optional arguments, uh, so there's various ways that we can split the call path and, and have uh, arguments assigned once in a while or not. We have both uh, required and non-required keyword arguments. Uh, and then we have rest args or, or var, var args for both positional arguments and for all those keywords that you didn't use. And typically you're not going to see all of these in the same signature, but you will see any one of these in many different methods. And so having to adapt those call paths so that we can pass positional arguments efficiently and all these other forms is a challenge. Uh, right now, this is one of the main reasons why if we have var args or we have keyword args, we're going with the simple approach of just creating the, the, the data structure and passing it through. Uh, for targeted uses, the simple cases that people actually run, we will eventually get it down to just passing on the call stack and having no uh, intermediate data structures. Uh, another one that's been a pain in the ass for us. Uh, so there are a, a few core methods, and these are only methods that are uh, 
at least in C, Ruby, and JRuby implemented essentially in native code in C or Java, uh, there's a few core methods that are able to set local variables on the caller, specific local variables. This is a, a pattern from Perl and some of the, uh, the you know, early Unix languages. Uh, so for example, uh, this case we have a regular expression match. Uh, it might set this magic tilde variable. There are other functions that will then read that variable. It's not, alloc it's not shown statically in the code, so you don't know that it's going to be needed. And all these calls are dynamic, so we have to guess at when a caller is going to need frame access. Uh, currently we do that pessimistically. I'll talk a bit more later about how we're doing that. Um, we have, of course, evals and we have binding capture, so you can capture all of the, the local state, which includes local variables, the frame fields, and so on, uh, pass them around, and then evaluate code against that same thing. Uh, again, binding is just the dynamic call, so we pessimistically say if we see the binding call or the eval call, we're probably going to need to do a full deoptimization. It'd be better if we could do that on demand, but the challenges of doing it dynamically and then backing off when we need to grab the frame are difficult to do on the JVM. Um, and then, of course, closures. Closures capture the surrounding state, uh, but the stickiest part of it is that even if you have an explicit co closure in the code, like a lambda, Elsewhere, that closure can be reconverted into a full binding of the original location where it was defined. So we can't even statically look at the closure and say it only needs access to variables A and B because someone might eval code against that closure in another place and need access to variables C and D and the frame state and everything else. It's a very interesting feature. I know a lot of Rubyists love this one, but this is the biggest pain for me. We could do so much better job of optimizing closures if we could statically determine what it needed and not have to basically carry the world with us every time we create a closure. Uh, this also gets very complicated because if we want to optimize through this closure, we've got to be able to inline the caller that receives it and the closure itself, pull that all back. Oops, we made a mistake. They're turning it into a binding. Now we need to be able to de-optimize all that. It's just a mess. It gets really complicated and we're not doing anything uh, really advanced in this area yet. Um, this is an example of the code I mentioned. So here we're doing a regular expression match with a string. That sets this hidden dollar tilde local variable, which you can access directly in the code or not. My point here is you're not accessing it, so you would have to know that this regular expression match is doing a call to a core method that modifies the caller's frame. And then regular expression last match, again, another dynamic call, but it's able to look back into the caller's frame, dig up that, that match object, and then give you some details about it. So these are the sort of things that get in our way, optimizing frames away. Uh, and I think this is the last one I'm going to talk about. So then the, clo the, the other closure problem is the same one that Java has. Uh, especially as you get down to the lower levels of the runtime into the core classes like array each and so on, uh, we've got a single method body that is receiving hundreds or thousands of different closures, a, a th hundreds of thousands of different functions that need to be dispatched back. Well, that immediately goes megamorphic, so there's nothing for us to inline uh, unless we can get the, the caller, uh, the called method to inline as well and, and specialize. Uh, like I said, this is more of an issue for core classes. Uh, so array each, uh, you know, basic enumeration methods at the core level. Uh, once you get further up in libraries and then user code, usually if you have a method that receives a closure, it's only getting two or three in a particular application run. So we, we kind of balance what we can optimize. We'll, we'll work on uh, specializing those really hot ones in the core, uh, but user code, maybe we won't spend as much time trying to get that optimized, save a little bit of overhead and, and code generation. Uh, yes, like I said, user code usually only sees a handful of closures. Uh, and this is the general issue of JVM right now. This is the same problem that lambdas have. There's no good way to, to, to decide how to specialize through to a lambda. There's so many different callers and so many different paths through this code. Uh, this is an open question right now. Uh, in the Ruby Truffle side, I think they're taking a fairly aggressive approach and they just go ahead and inline straight through all the time. Uh, that probably works to get all these closures inlining, but we're also generating a lot more code. So trade-offs. We need, we need a better heuristic for when a closure receiving method needs to be specialized for the closure. Uh, yeah, example of our array each. Uh, again, this is just implemented in very simple Java code. Uh, that block.yield there is going to be any number of, a, of, of possible target functions. Um, so we're not gonna get anything to inline there. But 
as in this case, this is a fairly simple piece of code that we could just re-specialize on a call, call site by call site basis and then get the actual closure to inline with the each logic. Uh, we've prototyped this, it works, but again, heuristics deciding when to do it are fuzzy right now. Okay, and then the last thing here. Uh, so then the general challenges of building on top of the JVM. Uh, we still have no real good way to emit invoke dynamic from Java code. Uh, so we do have some basic call site caching and other s mechanisms to speed up method dynamic method calls from Java, but they're not inlining, they're not getting the benefit of invoke dynamic. We need a way to solve that. Um, looking at some of the tools that Remy's been playing with, we've done some code, um, code rewriting experiments of our own. So if we always write with the same sort of pattern in the Java code, we'll go and rewrite those to invoke dynamic call sites, perhaps. Shouldn't be too difficult to do. Uh, it's coming, yes. So it is coming along. And as always, there's a lot of things that are coming along. So we're, we're gonna look, for, for, look towards the future, but we have to find a solution for it now, too. Uh, so no way to force specialization. The way I'm gonna force specialization uh, without having the, the magic of partial evaluation and all the other cool stuff that's in Truffle, uh, we will have a Ruby-based method for each. Uh, we will compile it to bytecode, and then on a targeted basis, I'll just re-emit that bytecode for each call site. Sounds horribly heavy, right? Well, it's really the only option I have at this point to say specialize this method for these different call sites is to re-emit the bytecode and then hope that the JVM inlines and, and wipes it all away for me. Uh, we've also been looking at doing our own specialization for numeric types. Uh, again, the challenge is with at least fixed nums, have being able to back off to an object type. That isn't in there, but uh, it, it's coming along. Uh, and, the, and, you know, one of the bottom line things here, code generation is still very cumbersome. It's very heavy to do this stuff. Uh, JRuby jits each individual method body into its own class with one function. Uh, these methods need to be garbage collectible, so each of them goes into their own class in their own class loader. Now you're starting to see how much it piles up. If we had a very lightweight way of saying, here's a snippet of code, and here's a snippet of code, and here's a snippet of code, we'd use this much more aggressively. Because we do see that the inlining heuristics, the optimization that the JITs give us, both C2 and Grawl, do a great job if we can break this up into little snippets and do our own optimiz or, or do our own individual pieces, but the plumbing to get there stops us. It really prevents us from being as, uh, um, as aggressive as we'd like in generating code and throwing it away and trying new things. Um, so this is still a problem. And again, uh, one thing that, that Truffle gives us is a lot more hinting for what we want the JIT to do. We are just firing and forgetting. We're praying that it's gonna line up. Uh, I spend a great deal of time running through uh, user cases, actual applications to see if things are inlining, to see what sort of assembly we're getting out of it. We're hooking up the ideal graph visualizer to see what's happening in the different phases. I'm working as well as I can to hint to the JVM with code patterns and, and invoke dynamic, but I have no way to explicitly say things that I need to be able to say. And that's a problem. So building a dynamic language on the JVM is still a challenge, especially if we're talking standard specified JVM. We have essentially two blunt tools. Uh, it's, the plumbing is there for this. The two blunt tools are that we can generate more bytecode and throw it at the JVM, and we can use invoke dynamic to wire up these different pieces together in dynamic ways. Uh, but they're very low level, very cumbersome tools, and each of these languages, we end up rolling our own utilities around it. So we're not sharing as many resources as we could. Uh, we need better tools for doing small code generation, little methods, little function objects, without burdening the JVM too much. Uh, we need better ways to explicitly hook into safe points and guarding mechanisms at the JVM level from normal Java code, at the very least, but you know, at bytecode level, where we, JRuby, we do all the bytecode generation. We're fine if it's a bytecode feature initially. Um, dynamically binding stuff, again, everyone writes their own plumbing for this. Uh, our dynamic binding is not too complicated, so I'm not super worried, but it needs more richness in uh, being able to describe it, especially as we're talking about AOT and other ways we want to be able to start pre-compiling some of this, getting it to, to, to dynamically work, but still be visible to the JVM what we're trying to do. 
And then, of course, de-optimization. We have no way of saying, I want to be able to back out of this frame and jump back into it. Interestingly, some of the, the Project Loom stuff that's making frames more reifiable and pulling them off might actually be helpful to us in the future. Being able to say, OK, I got a de-opt right here. Let's do something along the lines of a coroutine and pull off these frames. Well, now I've got access to all of the information that's been saved off in this stack. I can do some of the de-optimization work and then perhaps resume at a higher level with a different piece of code. Just spitballing here. Ideas that, that make the frame a little bit more uh, inspectable and visible for JVM languages. So that kind of leads into what Truffle is doing. Uh, so we've been following Truffle since the early days. Uh, I think it was 2000, I, I got some dates here. I think it was 2013 we first saw the Ruby implementation really starting to show some promise. Uh, so there's a lot of benefits here to building with Truffle. Uh, for the, one of the biggest ones is we only have to implement the AST. We implement an AST for our language, we mark it up with various JIT hints and specialization hints, uh, and then either hand specialize, long float and whatnot, or uh, Truffle will also do some generation for you. Uh, caveat here, I have not done a whole lot of work with Truffle. This is from my discussions with Truffle folks and with our, our discussions with the Truffle Ruby, but I think this is generally uh, where it's going. Uh, we also get very good trace-specific optimization of these pieces of code. So in the same way that I would like to have little snippets that represent my program, these little snippets of Ruby in the AST, they can trace right through them, find a path that maybe doesn't have anything to do with the method boundaries. It's really just the, the flow of the code. And as a result, they're not throwing as much code at the system, uh, they're not throwing as much byte code for sure, they don't have to deal with that and they get a better trace, a better specialization along those specific paths. Uh, they get uh, in the framework, they also have the ability to specialize object shapes. So if it looks like you're always allocating a two element object here, it'll pack it properly. Uh, if it looks like it's always holding longs or floats, it will generate the, co generate the object structure behind the scenes. Uh, we're starting to do this somewhat by hand and more and more with code generation, but again, we're, we're limited by what we can throw at the JVM from a bytecode level uh, and then having to have our own little fallbacks that, that really don't hook into the JIT. The JIT doesn't get a lot of visibility into our hand-generated code. Uh, the ability to communicate guards and inlining and specialization, be able to tell the JIT that I want this code to specialize or inline, uh, we have nothing like that. Uh, at, the, at the standard JVM specified level. Uh, these are professional tools for professional users and it's been scary to try and add some of this to the JVM, but if we are intent on having the JVM, and I mean capital J, capital V, capital M, the real JVM, the specified version of it, be a platform for more and more new languages as we go forward, we have to deal with this. We have to address this problem because we can't get enough information down to the JIT from a JVM level to get the optimization that we want. Uh, and then finally, uh, there's the, the other non-runtime sort of benefits, being able to integrate with other Truffle languages, calling across JavaScript runtime and so on, optimizing across these languages, which with Invoke Dynamic, we largely do get Java to inline into Ruby and so on, but they have a, a they're able to do all of that partial evaluation, all of that trace specialization across languages, which is very cool. Uh, and then well, there's a whole bunch of cool tooling that's coming out. I haven't had a chance to play with it. Um, you can take a look at any of the other Truffle talks to get more details there. Well, so then, then it brings us to Truffle Ruby. So Truffle Ruby is a really cool, really excellent implementation of Ruby uh, that's heavily based on Truffle, focusing on peak performance uh, and integrating with the C Ruby world uh, somewhat more than being a JVM language. It's really a Ruby implementation to replace standard C Ruby. Uh, so most of the core is implemented in Ruby. They have an extensive set of AST nodes in Truffle. Uh, even with, with specific uh, library level features of Ruby turned into AST nodes. Uh, so for example, there is not like a concrete array class that exists in Truffle Ruby. The structure of the array and the calls that you would make are implemented as array nodes. Here there's a node for setting a value into an array. There's a node for uh, sorting an array. Uh, this allows it to optimize along with all the other code and specialize all these paths, specialize the array shapes. Uh, it's much richer than us just having a single implementation of array that we hope the JVM will, will see through and optimize. Um, but it is also very dependent on Graal. Uh, this does not run, I mean, 
technically, you can run Truffle languages on non graal JVMs, but it's unreasonably slow. Like, it's, there's no way that you would ever run in production or anywhere with that performance. And so you can do a lot of cool stuff with Truffle, but you're going to have to run it on Graal. That's it. And that is also a problem. We have users across a lot of different runtimes. Uh, now, they are doing a very good job of getting a complete set of Ruby features. So one of the early goals of Truffle Ruby was to show that Truffle uh, could do all of these really hard features. Uh, and Chris mentioned, Chris Seaton, who worked on, works on Truffle Ruby, mentioned years ago, I did a blog post where it said, if you want to run Ruby fast, here are the 10 or 15 things that you have to be able to do. And they've worked their way right down that list and checked off a few boxes that JRuby has not been able to. So they've done an excellent job of really filling out the full set of Ruby features and getting the performance that you'd want out of it, uh, even to the point of now supporting C extensions uh, using the Sulong uh, LLVM interpreter framework. They have actual C extensions that will load and execute and call out to, uh, to native libraries. Uh, binding of caller, which is, again, another terrifying feature of Ruby that you can just say, I want the, the full binding of a method that's 10 methods up in the stack. Uh, this is a feature they've tried to get into Ruby for years. Obviously, it's trivial for C Ruby, which doesn't do any frame elimination or optimization to support this. They just go dig it out of their stack. But for those of us that are trying to optimize frames away and trying to write high-performance Ruby stuff, this is a terrifying, terrifying feature for us, of course. Um, and, and even to the point of doing optimized evals. So if they can see that the eval source is largely constant or is templatable, they can optimize through an eval, not do the reparsing and recompilation of it, and get like straight up ex uh, compiled execution from evaled code. Again, it's very cool that they can do this. Practically, I don't know it, that it's something any users really want uh, because you will go to C Ruby, which is the 99% of deployments out there is running on C Ruby. You go to J Ruby, which is maybe the other 1% or 2%, uh, and we don't have this. So it's a cool feature, but it does get in the way of, of optimizing a lot of these runtimes. Um, and I, like I mentioned, I show, the, show some benchmarks where we're comparing J Ruby versus Truffle Ruby. Uh, Truffle Ruby is still in development, ongoing optimization work. Uh, if something doesn't run fast, the stock answer is, well, we haven't worked on making that run fast. So I can say the same thing. I haven't worked on making a lot of things run faster than JRuby either. Uh, but take these with a grain of salt that there is ongoing work with anything that you see. Uh, I wanted to answer some questions about uh, the, the timeline, the, the lineage of how Truffle Ruby kind of came out of Oracle, went into JRuby, and then left JRuby. Uh, as I mentioned, in 2013, Truffle Ruby was first presented at JVM Language Summit, and it's ex incredibly exciting. I went out side and I made a call to Tom, the other co-lead of JRuby, and I talked to him about how awesome this is, how we want to be able to get in on this and start using this technology. Uh, we've, we were excited then and we we're still excited about what's possible with Truffle, uh, with the hooks into Graal, and with Graal itself as just the JIT technology. Uh, so shortly after that, uh, we had some meetings, we had some discussions, uh, we managed to get Truffle Ruby open sourced, pull it out into the public, uh, merged into the JRuby code base under our licenses, uh, and for several years we did side-by-side -side development. Uh, we shared a lot of uh, common libraries, we shared some strategies for implementing Ruby, uh, and we helped get Truffle Ruby into user hands. We shipped several releases of JRuby where there was a flag you could turn on and it would switch over and it would run with Truffle. And so if you were running on the right runtime and running with the right JIT, you could use JRuby to play with Truffle. And it helped generate some buzz for it, helped get some people involved and, and interested in the project. Uh, as things went on, it, it was clear that the, the direction that Truffle Ruby folks wanted to go uh, with a much more Truffle-focused implementation, very much dependent on the Truffle and Graal stack, uh, focusing on C Ruby extensions, uh, not looking so much at the JVM side that it was very different. Uh, I've got a slide here about this. So th there was a different direction that the Truffle Ruby folks wanted to go with it. It seemed to make sense that they would spin back off into their own project, and that's where we've gone for the past couple of years. Um, and so, so I've mentioned these briefly. The biggest thing that was a problem with us trying to integrate the Truffle approach, or at least the Truffle approach as in Truffle Ruby, is that we are a JVM language. 
We integrate with Java. We have normal Java objects floating around. We can implement interfaces. We can extend Java classes. Uh, we can deploy in standard Java settings. Uh, none of these things really worked with the way the Truffle, approve, uh, Truffle Ruby approach was going. All objects looked like dynamic object. Uh, there was no real ability to, to do many of the Java integration features that we want, like implementing interfaces. Uh, it's not enough to just be able to call back and forth to Java libraries. You gotta be able to pass objects out that are callable and efficient, uh, and that uh, the Truffle approach adds a couple layers of indirection because they want full control over this object layout, out of this structure. Uh, we're approaching it from a different perspective, having normal Java objects, and then maybe generating specialized versions of those. But you'll always have a Ruby array object in hand. You'll always have a Ruby hash object in hand. If you implement uh, a list interface on your Ruby class, the Ruby object that comes out is the implementation of the interface. Much more direct integration. And this was one big reason why the Truffle Ruby approach didn't work for us. Uh, and the other thing is that we, as I mentioned, we tried to implement the C extension API. We had, uh, we had some folks who've actually done, done some work on the Truffle side that did a Google Summer of Code project once. Uh, did, some C, did a basic set of the C extension APIs uh, using JNI, uh, using various tricks to try and deal with some of the, the invasive aspects of, of the C API where you get direct pointers. C extensions can go and write directly into objects. And this is based on a very simple runtime in C Ruby. Uh, you can poke the insides of these objects. You can modify them directly. You can save pointers off into an opaque global somewhere in your C extension. We ended up deciding that it was not gonna be worth the effort. Uh, there were too many calls back and forth. It was a very fine-grained API. There are way too many tricks that we had to do to map these direct pointer accesses into managed uh, heap accesses. And we have no confidence that these C extensions that are out there are going to work in a current setting at all. These are, these are grotty pieces of C code written by Rubyists who just needed to write some C code for a single threaded runtime with direct heap access, it's, that's scary. Like I have no idea what sort of concurrency issues the Truffle Ruby folks are gonna run into. You know, I wish them the best on this, but these are not the greatest pieces of C code out there. Um, they're not the best behaved. And even when you get down to some of the C libraries that are being called, some of those aren't even gonna be thread safe and they need to have some locking around them. So this is a long process to try to get C extensions going. Uh, the Truffle Ruby folks really wanted to hit this hard and that was not our direction to go. We use Java extensions, they're written with concurrency in mind, they fit into the heap and generally perform better than C extensions on any of these runtimes. And we've got confidence about concurrency and safety and whatnot. Okay. A little bit more about JRuby versus Truffle Ruby. I mentioned the line of code discussion. Let's see, I got about, okay, we're gonna go a little faster. Uh, lines of code, I mean, there is still quite a bit of Java code in Truffle Ruby, 94,000 lines, and this is really just the language, is the 94,000 lines, the AST. A whole bunch more gets generated. If you look on the Java side, this is our AST, this is also our IR, our compilers for it, all of our optimizations, our JIT, our embedding APIs for the JVM, all of our Java integration stuff. So 241,000 lines I don't think is too bad for what we've accomplished with JRuby. Uh, on the Ruby side, like I mentioned, most of Truffle Ruby is implemented in Ruby code. Some of it's been borrowed from the Rubinius project, some of it's been written by hand, but they're, they're doing a good job of optimizing through all that Ruby. Um, and we, like I mentioned, we are sharing some libraries here. Uh, we want to be able to do more of this. There, there are other places where we could share across Truffle Ruby. The bottom line, though, is that the Truffle Ruby approach is very ambitious. It was too ambitious for us to try and integrate into a real world, uh, use, a real world Ruby that had lots of users. It's very ambitious, but it seems to be working. So why are we not looking at doing Truffle on the JRuby side? Uh, well, oh God, I don't know how this got animated. Let's see. Well, I'll just click through this. So, this, this is the users we have out there. This is maybe a year or two old, and some of these have changed, and some have been added. But we have hundreds, I don't know, thousands, maybe tens of thousands of users out there doing JRuby stuff. Uh, some of these have millions of users. Uh, BBC, for example, all the election results that you see from referendums and from Brexit and so on, that's a JRuby application that's serving all that stuff up. So we got real users out there that we're trying to support. 
we can't just dive into truffle and say, okay, well, you're all gonna be left behind for a while while we do all just truffle work. Uh, we need to do something incremental so that we can continue to support all these users. Um, other reasons, um, the vast majority of our users are still on Java 8. This is probably not so different across the different runtimes. Uh, Truffle Ruby's been developed for about five years and it's, it's still going. Uh, so we wouldn't have even been able to say at this point that we've got a production option for Truffle users on JRuby. Um, it's moving very quickly, but it's a very big piece of work to implement Ruby and get it to run well. Uh, there's still no supported production runtime for this. This is probably the biggest one. Uh, we can start working on this stuff and we will start look, looking at this and experimenting with it, but people need to be able to run it in the real world. Um, okay, and the last one I mentioned already, the, the job integration aspects are, are cumbersome for us. So what are we doing? Well, we work within the bounds of the JVM specification and JDK libraries that are available. Uh, we have always been trying to cooperate with JVM folks, the JSR folks, and JEPs to get those little pieces we need. Uh, Invoke Dynamic being one of the biggest ones. We work very closely with the Invoke Dynamics folks and it looks great now. Uh, we creatively use the capabilities we have at the JVM level. Oops. Uh, and then we're, we're pragmatic about this. We reconsider what we've got available to us at any given time. Uh, and so that includes possibly looking at doing some truffle work in the future. Uh, we don't know where that's gonna go yet. All right, I'm gonna have to go through these quickly, but they're all single slide. So optimizing JRuby. We do what we can on top of the JVM with available APIs. Uh, that's the biggest limitation, is that we work within the boundaries of the specification. Uh, and so I'm gonna run through a few of these quickly. Oh boy, this run way too long. Uh, first of all, multi-tiered JIT. So JRuby does not immediately go into bytecode. Uh, this was the approach that was taken by Nashorn and by a lot of other JVM languages. It's obviously just too expensive. When we've got thousands of Ruby methods coming into the system, most of them are gonna get called once or twice. So we have an interpreter. Then we have our, our separate phases where we turn it into optimized interpreter code and then eventually into JIT. Uh, basic layout of how we've got our, our, our IR compiler. We do our analysis. We create our control flow graph. We do some static optimizations, a little bit of profiled optimizations in here too, and then we can either go to a fast interpreter or a bytecode generated version. This is kind of what the instructions look like. Uh, this is all a register machine, and so when we compile this down to JVM, uh, it's just local variables, and it translates almost directly. Uh, this is much simpler than the original compiler that was based on the AST. I essentially just translate the IR directly into JVM uh, uh, local variable reads and writes. We do have a plugin so that we can use Ideal Graph to look at our IR and see what our passes are doing. Uh, we haven't worked too hard on this because we're not doing a lot of speculative optimization yet, but it's coming along. Uh, we have all of the different pieces are showing up. Uh, and we, you know, here's a, an example of a dead code elimination pass. We can see what it's actually doing for our IR, which is on top of the JVM. Uh, I mentioned object shaping. We are trying to do more generation of code uh, that, that has the correct shape of object. Rather than having dynamically growing arrays or dynamically growing objects, pick the right size, pack those fields in there. Uh, we do not support primitives yet. We're working on getting that in there. Uh, we are also uh, need a little bit more smarts so that we can have a, an individual Ruby class that may have multiple shapes, depending on where it was allocated and how it was used. Uh, an example from a, a little Rails benchmark. So here is a whole bunch of these objects being generated. Uh, this part up at the top is obviously what I'm trying to get rid of, this, this array-based uh, structure that we would hold of our values in. But we're doing pretty good with generating these objects and, and having packed objects for most of the, the use cases. Similar arrays, uh, we do some hand specialized one and two element arrays right now. Uh, we are not doing it as, a, as aggressively as Truffle where they can optimize all the different shapes. Uh, we want to unify the generation code with the object stuff uh, and then of course getting the primitives. This is, this is a very similar, uh, similar task that we need to do. Uh, and just doing the one and two element arrays, well here's that same Rails benchmark, a real world benchmark, and almost half of the arrays that are being allocated actually fit into the one array or t one element or two element boxes. Uh, so it's, it's not, we'd like to be able to just generate any shape, but we're doing pretty good with just a few handwritten ones. Uh, we will continue to do a few handwritten ones, work on our code generation, and then decide on heuristics what we actually spit out. 
Uh, of course, invoke dynamic. I'm going to skip through this. Um, almost everything is inlining now in JRuby, and especially with the gains we've seen in C2 and in Graal lately, we're trying to make sure that that's the case. Get everything to inline, try to specialize all these different paths. Uh, so most things are inlining. These are the ones that we're not doing just yet. Closures, I mentioned we need more specialization to get rid of megamorphism. Uh, variable arity calls, it's just a matter of getting an invoke dynamic to adapt those. Uh, and the calls, the paths that we do have, for example, with keyword arguments, we need to be able to pass those on the stack rather than constructing a full object. Uh, and the last one here, frame elimination. Uh, so we are working on doing frame elimination, getting rid of some of that out-of-band data that we have in Ruby, uh, mostly by statically analyzing the code uh, right now, but uh, hopefully using de-optimization later so we can back off and do it right. Uh, I'm going to skip this. We don't have a lot of time. We do what we can based on what users need. So we'll get to the fun part here. Uh, so here's some benchmarks. We'll run through these quick five minutes or so. Uh, so Mandelbrot is the new uh, Fibonacci that everyone's using. We don't use Fib anymore, right? Uh, we've, it's a simple fractal generator. Uh, here is the basic code. This is almost all numeric stuff not a lot of object state, data structures, and so on. So this is a test of how well numeric algorithms are working in uh, JRuby today. So we take a look at this. We've got a baseline here. We can go with CRuby. It's about three and a half seconds. I think this is a Mandelbrot 1000 by 1000. Uh, JRuby on C2, this is using invoke dynamic. You would expect that we'd be significantly faster than the CRuby implementation. Now, what happened in the past six months or so is that we started to see this. So on just the community edition of the Graal JIT, we are actually seeing these numeric boxes get swept away. We're getting numeric performance that is comparable to writing it in Java. And perhaps even cooler, uh, here it is compared with Truffle Ruby. We've got JRuby on Graal CE. Uh, we've got JRuby on Graal EE, which does get a little bit of a gain, not a ton. Uh, and then comparing those with Truffle Ruby, well, we're in the same range here. Now, this is a very small, very specific case, but we are matching Truffle Ruby on at least some of these smaller numeric benchmarks. Uh, I think I'm going to skip over the stupid Ruby tricks. This is the arrays, var arg stuff. We are getting a gain from Graal here and, and getting some of these objects to eliminate. We'd like to see more, though. Uh, these are some user benchmarks that were contributed to me just the other day. These are pure Ruby hashing algorithms that he's been testing on JRuby and on Truffle Ruby. Uh, here is a bit of the code. It's got objects, it's got dynamically allocated fields, lots of method calls, lots of numerics. So it's not just a simple numeric algorithm anymore. There's a lot more involved. Uh, what do these look like? Well, JRuby on Graal, uh, I believe this was JRuby on the community edition of Graal, is actually running this faster than Truffle Ruby, with only the limited optimizations that we've done right now. Uh, what about the next one? Oh, well, now Truffle Ruby's faster. Uh, so this is a different, different implementation, a different hashing algorithm, uh, and then we go back and forth again. So the Truffle Ruby approach is doing some really awesome things, but we are also doing pretty solid even on just C2 here beating Truffle Ruby on one of these benchmarks. Uh, that's great. That means that I don't necessarily need to hit performance for the folks that are running on C2 all that much right now. Um, last two benchmarks I'll run through here. So Red Black Tree, again, this is a much richer one. Uh, I'm not going to go through all the code because it's fairly extensive. We have our node objects with their dynamically allocated fields. We have lots and lots and lots of method calls, including many that probably don't need to be done repeatedly, like x.parent, x.parent, x.parent. So not the greatest code, but it's a good, ex good ex uh, a larger example of a piece of Ruby that we're trying to optimize. Uh, here is our benchmark where we do some running through, we build a big tree, we walk through it in various ways, and then tear it down. And how does this one look? Well, there's CRuby. Uh, JRuby on C2 with Invoke Dynamic is looking pretty good. Uh, JRuby on Graal is not as good. So C2 is actually doing a better job optimizing this with the way that we perform and the way we emit code. Uh, Truffle Ruby is a little bit faster than us on C2, and you know that's, that's great for what they've accomplished. EE really helps them here, so they're getting a much larger boost from, uh, from Graal VM EE. Uh, but we're not doing terrible. We're looking pretty good with the limited set of optimizations we've done. This is the last one. So active record. 
Um, so this is just doing a whole bunch of select operations. It's a mostly full Ruby stack. The last mile is going to be a native driver of some kind. Uh, and again, we get about the equivalent performance on Graal here with the current set of optimizations. So it's kind of a mixed bag. Sometimes Graal is way faster for us. Sometimes it doesn't make as much of a difference. Now this one versus Truffle Ruby, again, caveat, this is not a case that they've spent a lot of time optimizing, but we are still well faster than Truffle Ruby for a real world case, running a Rails application, anywhere from five to 10 times faster with what Truffle Ruby has accomplished so far. And of course I expect this to change on both of our ends, but right now, JRuby is a better choice if you're gonna run Rails. Truffle Ruby is not ready for this. Um, Warm-up curve on JRuby, not too bad. Warm-up curve of JRuby versus Truffle Ruby, they definitely have a longer tail to get this stuff up and going. And again, this is stuff that our users complain about. We need a better answer for this if we're gonna start doing the Truffle approach in JRuby so everybody doesn't suddenly have their applications grinding uh, to a halt every time they restart. Okay, wrapping up here. Uh, so I mentioned most of this, performance notes. Uh, yeah, small benchmarks definitely are looking great on the Truffle Ruby side, on Truffle approach. Uh, real world large workloads seem to need some work, and I don't know where that, where that work needs to be done. Um, and Rails is still a very difficult nut to crack. This is the first year where we've been able to say convincingly that JRuby is the fastest way to run Rails, with all the work that we've done over the years. Uh, it's complicated, it's a big complicated framework. Last few, few slides. Uh, so the future of JRuby. We are a JVM language, and we need to live within the JVM specification. Uh, so we're going to at least continue to support Java 8. We're going to continue to work within the specifications and the JDK APIs that are available. Uh, but we're going to continue to push on that. We want to run better, we want to specialize more code, we want to get object shaping working better in a way that works across all the different JVMs. So we're not leaving our AS400 users behind or our J9 users or anybody else. Uh, we also are gonna to continue to work on getting better optimization above the JVM level in our IR. Um, that is all prototyped but not released in any way yet. JRuby and Graal, we like what we see with this. Uh, inlining does seem to be a little bit more reliable and partial escape analysis is really working for us if we get all the pieces in the right place. Uh, I have experimented a little bit with starting to do our own targeted optimizations for Graal. So about a year ago, before the partial escape analysis did what we wanted it to, I actually just dug around in Graal and in the JVMCI logic and wrote my own Graal pass. Um, so I wrap Graal with my JRuby Graal, I insert my own little pass in there, I flag objects I know I don't care about ident identity as being virtualizable, and then I managed to get the partial escape analysis to work for basic JRuby objects with no other real tweaks. Uh, some of these started to just work, so I haven't returned to this experiment, but it is not terribly difficult for us to say, plug in our own code, our own logic, that tweaks the way Graal does optimization on a, on a language by language basis. It's pretty trivial code, and this again is just a quick experiment, but it, was, it worked very well. Uh, and then finally, JRuby and Truffle. Maybe Truffle will come back into JRuby, maybe there are pieces of Truffle Ruby that we can start incorporating, smaller subsections. Uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna take a look at this. We're, we're gonna do whatever makes sense for the users that we have and trying to make JRuby run as well as possible. Uh, I don't know what the, the cross JVM answer is here. Uh, are we saying that Truffle is the way to go and so we're all just gonna run on Graal and we're all gonna run on a single lo vendor locked in platform? I don't think that's what we want, right? We want a way to be able to get at least the essence of what tr Truffle is doing and stay true to what the JVM is, so that we can run across platforms, we can get new JVMs into the system. Uh, we, gotta, we gotta find a way to answer that question. All right, summarizing. Uh, Bytecode generation and invoke dynamic are cumbersome, but they are working for us, especially depend if you have a JIT that can do some of the stuff that Graal can do, this stuff is working. And we're going to continue to push on that going forward. Uh, the partial escape analysis looks like a game changer for a lot of benchmarks. I would like to see other implementations try to uh, tackle this problem. Uh, we'd like to have more reliable escape analysis so that we can just rely on boxes where we need to. Uh, it, it is still a little bit unpredictable. You get one path that doesn't inline properly and suddenly the analysis doesn't work anymore. And all, all of it goes back to objects and it's 100 times slower. 
Uh, we'll continue to work above the JVM to optimize, and uh, you know, I think it's time that we'll start playing with Truffle Ruby and doing some experiments with it ourselves. Uh, I'm hoping to, to hear more about it uh, in the next couple days, and you know, we'll see what we can do. And that's all I've got. A little over, thank you. <laughs>